Good morning and welcome to the latest in our series of Family Business Insights. I am delighted this morning to be joined by Sam Kirk, who is the Managing Director at JFlex. Um, Sam, good morning. Good morning, Paul. Thanks ever so much for, uh, for, for giving me such a platform to talk. <laughs> well, you've been, on an, you've been on an exciting journey. So let's, let's just start with a few slides in terms of a little bit of the history, the context in terms of what you do. Um, and just to set the scene, I guess you're a UK manufacturer, but um, if you could just give a little bit of an insight into the, the journey today. And actually, I know you've, you've taken over the managing directorship very recently and how you did that. So let, let's, let's start there and then see where this takes us. Yeah, I mean, just to, to give a bit of context, obviously, you can see from, from the slide on screen, um, the company's called JFlex and the sort of strap line, if you like, that we've, we've spent a bit of time over the past couple of years trying to figure out what it is that we do, along with the whole vision and, and strategy for the business is innovative rubber solutions. Now, ordinarily, when you talk to a room full of strangers or um, indeed, a, you know, a, a Zoom call full of people you've not met before, when you say that, that we supply rubber, um, you, you generally sort of have two thoughts and you learn a lot about the audience as well Paul um, sure. when you say the words rubber so the, the first thought that some people have is um, erasers um, you know pencil rubbers um, and the other one is perhaps the um, how do we put this for politely for 11 o'clock on a Friday morning the, the more um, uh, interesting minds shall we say <laughs> um, I'm trying to be polite there obviously <laughs> You know, I didn't say anything to help you out there because I didn't want to say the wrong thing. But. Yeah, I hate to break it to you. It's, it's none of those. Um, what it is, is lots of very weird and wonderful widgets. And, and as I said, we spent a lot of time over the past couple of years defining what it is that we do and, and making the vision for the business what we do. So the vision we, we, we've all agreed on that is that defines the business is to be the go to supplier for innovative rubber solutions for international industrial markets. Um, and as I said, lots of weird and wonderful widgets. Um, I'm not going to explain what every single one of those things is, because obviously we want to talk about the journey that the business has been on rather than the products. But the, the variety of products that we get involved in, things like um, this little orange rubber here, um, you will all have these in your homes on your television remote control. So they are the buttons that you press on your television remote. And obviously it goes through to a, uh, a circuit board underneath. Um, you've also got here, now this is a fascinating um, concoction we've got there. This is probably in every prison up and down the country and it's a collapsible hook. Um, again, I'm not going to too much detail as to why it's collapsible. I'm sure, Paul, you can use your imagination there. You're looking a bit perplexed. Um, Trying to smile. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we, we tend to get involved with, you know, quite, quite funky projects. People have got an idea, an engineer's got an idea and, and we're involved in the process of hopefully um, bringing that idea to to fruition. So I know it's corny to say this, but no day is the same for us because we get all sorts of, of wacky ideas from people. Some of the more, um, I guess, uh, less exotic products, we, we do um, a lot of tubing that is fitted to the side of railway tracks up and down the, the country. Again, tubing that is um, low smoke. So if it sets on fire, it doesn't release a harmful level of smoke. There's no toxins in it. It's got obviously resist you know, potentially being crushed by a train it's got to resist being nibbled by vermin um, so they're quite specialist products that we're 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 sort of handling um, in terms of our history we are 36 we started back in 1984 by john and jill or mum and dad um, we then moved into our um, first official factory a couple of years later we started out at home in 84 um, four years later we then moved to bigger premises uh, and in 1998, we, we moved to the facility that we are currently occupying now. And that's given us the opportunity to expand without the need to, to relocate. Uh, a couple of other key milestones along the way. 2004, we set up a distribution partnership in Australia. Um, 2010, we launched a, an office with a general manager in uh, India. Uh, and in recent years, as, as Paul says, we've, we've gone through a, a succession journey uh, where, where John, my father, has taken over the role of chairman and, and I've taken over the, the MD seat. Um, and, and one of the briefs that we've got for our marketing department is to, to, to shout about the company a little bit more, win one or two awards. And um, as you can see, 2018 and, and 19, we, we've, we've been doing that, which is um, obviously exciting. It's a nice day out and a nice evening out for the team as well. Um, the succession journey, Paul, I know this is the area that you want to talk about just very, very briefly started as a joke actually um, back in April 2017. Um, John said, um, I'm going to retire at 65 having just turned 64 and, and anybody who knows him 
knows he's a workaholic, knew that that was never going to happen. And I think we sort of just laughed and said, yeah, yeah, good one. Um, but he started saying it more and more and, and gradually we started taking him a bit more seriously. So um, we sort of said, how do you plan a succession process? Because we, we'd never been through anything like this before. And this was this was a bridge that we, we knew we'd have to cross at some point. And I think we kind of put it off and put it off because we thought, well, he's, he's not going to retire. He's not going to let go of the business. This, it's pointless trying to cross the bridge. Well, um, eventually he said, no, I, I, I do want to cross the bridge. And, and we, we literally said, well, what the hell do we do? We, we asked everybody in our network of contacts, um, how do you plan a succession process? What's involved? Um, and, and that involved contacting everybody and anybody that we knew. It was, you know, hopefully somebody would know how to, to go through this. Thankfully, um, they did um, and in the form of a chap called Tim. Um, and, and Tim was introduced to us by a mutual contact and vastly experienced uh, coach, mentor, non-exec director, advisor, whatever title you want to call it. But his background was um, in food manufacturing. Uh, he'd taken a private business public, um, left when it was about 1.6 billion turnover, um, and then he'd set his own business up. He then went into a family business. So he'd sort of got a, a, a quite a diverse background, um, and importantly, was a great fit for our business. He shared our values as a business, um, and he sort of supported the business in, in two areas to start off with, vision and strategy, and then leadership development um, as well, once we'd sort of nailed what the vision and strategy was. Um, for the future of the business. And I'm pleased to say that Tim, um, three years later, continues to support the business on a monthly basis. He chairs uh, our leadership team meeting once a month, um, and he also coaches uh, myself uh, and our newly appointed head of sales as well. So that's kind of in a nutshell, um, uh, the, 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 the journey that that we went on. I don't know whether you want me to stop now and ask questions, Paul. <laughs> yeah, let's just go back a bit then in terms of your, your progression. So you're now the managing director. So yeah. go back to kind of growing up. Mum and dad had set the business up. Um, what are your kind of first recollections of the business? And then kind of take me through what your career aspirations were in terms of how did you get involved in, in JFlex and start your role? And what did you do when you first started out? I'll tell you what, I'll, I'll stop the share so you can actually see me rather than just the, the, the slides. Um, my, I guess my youngest recollections were um, the unit that I'm now sat in, uh, actually. I, I would come down during the summer holidays as a, a kid on, on, on break from school and, and would, you know, pretend to get involved in sort of lumping rolls of rubber around that are pretty heavy for a, for a kid in, in the school holidays. Um, I, I never, I guess, never imagined coming into the business, to be honest, in those days. And, and there was never any pressure put on me either, which I think, um, again, through through your events, Paul, and, and various other family business events, I think quite often it's, it's, it's obvious that there is a bit of pressure on the next generation to come into the business. And I think for us, that was the key, was never, ever putting any pressure on. It was here, um, but I was never, ever forced to go down that route. And I actually, um, I went off and did something completely different for 10 years. Um, I um, spent 10 years in the media industry, which was an interesting learning curve. Um, it, it again teaches you about dealing with people and, and how not um, to deal with people, so to speak. Yeah. Um, and, and after sort of nine years, I'd had such good fun. I had a really bad year in that sector. And I decided that um, I needed to do something that was a little bit more sensible um, rather than just, um, I shan't use the phrase that some people use at the time, but mucking around on the radio, so to speak. Um, and, and you do think differently when you've got a mortgage uh, as well. And, and like most families, we have a lot of discussions when we get together for, for dinner and stuff. And it was actually Christmas dinner one year. Um, we had a conversation, the three of us. Um, and I just said, look, my current career is not working. Um, and you're at work a long time. You need to be happy. Yeah. Um, and, and that's where, uh, I guess, my journey with JFlex started over Christmas dinner. Um, and it was we, we shaped a role that would give me the, the, I guess, the creativity, if you like, that I'd been used to in the media sector. Um, and um, it gave me the opportunity to travel the world as well. And that's, that's really how we'd all started over, over a, a, a turkey dinner. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, they often say, and it's something I've seen before, family businesses often talk around the kitchen table and it's something as you get bigger, you try to avoid, but it's, it's really hard not to, isn't it, to be around the business decisions. But um, what was the, you've come from a media background. So the, yeah. the media environment is quite fun and fast and, and all those things to a manufacturing business. How did you make, what was what were the difficult things for you to do in making that step from one to the other? What, or were there any difficulties? 
I mean, look, I'm not going to sit here and start bad mouthing the media industry. I think there's a perception the media industry is fun and, and fast, and and it is it is at times, yeah, absolutely. But there are times where it's very mundane, very um, restrictive, and it's very fickle as well. You can be flavor of the month one minute, and then next minute you're out the door. Yep. Um, and I, I don't I don't particularly like that. I don't operate like that myself. Um, I think the challenges were. The, Ironically, there are a lot of similarities. I, obviously, my role was in in communicating and, yeah. and clear communicating, um, and obviously, my my career in JFlex was slightly accelerated because because of the succession we got in mind. Um, one day, um, but we didn't realise it would probably come as quick as it did, um, given that we didn't think that that Dad would let go. But um, I, I think communication is certainly um, one of the the, the biggest crossovers it's also as well for me this role is about meeting people i meet with customers i meet with suppliers um you know partners that we work with outside of the business so it's no different to that world because you were coming into contact with with various different businesses you were coming into contact with the public so it's whilst they do seem worlds apart there are plenty of, of similarities and again you get an appreciation for how business works and I didn't admit it at the time of leaving that particular industry. I didn't particularly get on with a boss, but I understand now, now I'm in the position that I am, why certain decisions were made. And I think, um, as I say, I wouldn't have admitted that at the time, but I, I you know, I'm, I'm, I'm man enough and, and, and experienced enough now to admit that, yeah, I probably was in the wrong. Um, you know, and I did hate the guy's guts at the time, but, you know, you understand now because you're in the same position that he was in. Yeah, it's just part of learning, isn't it? So, so, so you you, you come in. Your, your dad's the the managing director at the time. Um, How? I mean, you get on really well. With, you've always got on really well with your dad. And I heard you speak earlier this year in, in terms of, and he was in the room, which was was really lovely to see. But <laughs> how did you define your role? Because I know when you started out, you mentioned mum and dad by their names and not mum and dad. So there's that whole balance, is there, in terms of who are you in the office with and making decisions that they may not understand? How did you deal with all of those relationship issues? Well, I, I, from day one, I always said, for me, this is this is a job. Um, and if I if I was in any other job, it would be John and Jill. They are the owners of the business. They are not mum and dad, irrespective of. And, and I started out very much as a marketing executive, which is the sort of I don't like hierarchy, particularly. I'm not I'm not a massive fan of these complicated, you know, um, businesses with, you know, so many tiers of management and whatever. I think it gets very, very complicated. And but in simple terms, I did start out at the bottom of the ladder because I came into a role that was a junior role um, and then progressed um, and eventually sort of became the marketing manager before transitioning into the MD role. But, you know, for me, it was always very clear. It's, it's John and Jill between 8.30 and 5.00, and it still is. And I, I do have to remind um, perhaps some of our, our longer standing colleagues that it is John and Jill because th there is a tendency sometimes for them to go, oh, you know, you've seen your mum and dad, you know, later, or can you just ask your mum and dad about this? And it's... Not so much now because again I'm in you know in the in the MDC, but prior to that it was oh you won't just ask your dad about this when you next see him and it's um, it's a discipline I guess really you've got to get into the mindset that it's yes it is a family business but at the end of the day take the word family off it's a business you know and if it was anybody else's business I wouldn't be calling them mum and dad it would be John and Jill so it's for me it's yeah the first couple of months that was weird you know calling mum and dad John and Jill but it, it, to me it's second nature now because. Um, you know, I've been saying it for the last six years. Yeah, exactly. Um, so you, you start at the bottom, bottom yeah. right, and I guess you got an insight into everything that was going on and you say you travelled, so you got to, to see all, all the different facets of the business, which clearly yeah. stood you in good stead for the role that you're doing now. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we look, we we um, we no, no, don't make any secret of it, Paul. We, we work with um, partners in the UK. We work with partners in the Far East. Um, as I mentioned, we've got an office in, in Mumbai in India. So, um, yeah, you, you, you know, been some fantastic places over the years. Um, and again, it's it's family business. Again, you'll know this because you've, you've your network is is, is global. Um, but it, the, the element of family is really important. We've seen with some partners in particular in China. They really like that we're planning for the next generation now. And that's continuity in place because you can see they're doing it as well. And we're starting to see the next generations of some of the smaller businesses we work with that they're coming into the business as well now. Um, so it's, it's, you know, it's been for me really important, obviously, as I guess a figurehead for the business to actually um, get out there and meet these people because traditionally it's always been John. Um, you know, the, the J and J flex was always John, really. It was John and Jill, but it was always John that was the, I suppose, the figurehead for the business. And, yeah. you know, wherever you go around the world to, to visit customers, they always know John's name. And I suppose 
we don't want to lose that legacy because obviously it's you know 30 odd year legacy it's you know it's it's what's made the business successful and for me it's about continuing it and obviously as soon as they see your name they know there's a connection um but it's no it's been massively important to me to try and absorb myself in as many experiences that he has over the years but then take a step back and look at well how can i do it my way not necessarily the way that he's done it yeah and you said you never expected him to step down so quickly in terms of the md role how easy has it been for, for, your, for your father to, or how's, how easy has it been for John to, 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 to step back? Okay, Cham, the, the, the role he's got now as an ambassadorial role, it's, a more, it's, it's less hands-on, but still hands-on and still involved. Has he found it difficult to step back? I think that one of the key things, as daft as it sounds, is having a defined job description for a chairman. Um, we, we actually put a, a role in place um, that said, okay, you focus on this, I will focus as this as MD. And, and actually that has... I don't mean this in a horrible way, but it has kept us out of each other's way and potentially colliding on certain issues. Yeah. Um, at the moment, he he sort of leads the R and D side of the business, um, but again, we've got a, a, a succession plan in place there for a, a new colleague that's recently joined the business to sort of take on a bit more of that. But again, he's got no desire to 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 stop one hundred percent. And and at the moment, I don't really want him to because he is somebody that I can talk to on a regular basis about certain challenges. I now know, again, through the, the past couple of years, what issues to go and discuss with him and what issues that I keep to myself and deal with, because, again, it can can often cause conflict because he'll have his ways of doing things and I have my ways of doing things. And we, we don't always agree that each other's approach is, is the right approach. Um, but nevertheless, I crack on and, and go with my approach. <laughs> Well, you have to find a way of working, I guess, and, and, and to continue that relationship. Um, you obviously stepped into the managing director's role and there was a board of people around you and senior management team um, that obviously had been working with your, your or with, with John for, I'm really struggling, you can see it's I'm really struggling. It's really difficult. Um, <laughs> that, that worked with, with John over the years. Um, how have you managed to kind of embrace the people that within the business and what changes have, have happened so that you have have there been changes or are you still kind of the same team how's how has the first year two years gone for you i think i think one of the key things and, and I'm, I'm i'm conscious about cliches um you know because you can end up becoming a walking talking cliche if, you, if you're not careful um but for me the phrase right people right seats is is applicable um in this conversation paul because you're right, I, I did inherit a, a team that had been there to support John over the years. I think it was what was crucial in the early days was actually involving them in, in putting a vision and, and plan together for the future of the business. And um, I think um, one of the slides that was in the presentation that I, I've not put up on screen, but talked about when we when we started working with Tim, it was, well, what's the vision for the business? And, you know, John started talking, I started talking and he was like, that's great. Have you ever thought about writing that down? And again, it was like a light bulb moment there was, well, actually, no, we haven't. Then we included those guys in the process. We actually wrote down and, and everybody pretty much got the same, same thing written down in terms of the vision for the business. We just never thought about actually documenting it and sharing it with the rest of the organization, which, you know, I don't know why um, we just hadn't. So um, it was important we got buy-in. And I think because they all thought the vision for the business was pretty similar, I think we'd, we'd got buy-in straight away to that yep. we then communicated it obviously to the organization because we thought that might be an idea to let everyone know where we where, where the business is going but then there was a, a sort of third area that was i guess missing which was ownership and again it's a it's a challenge that i've seen in other businesses before it's everyone's responsible for something but the minute things go wrong or not quite to plan people shun that responsibility and it was that's what we were lacking the ownership so um Again, I, I thought that right people, right seats was a cliche, but then gradually you realised, you know what, actually, we're shifting from a management culture to a leadership culture here. And the management culture was very much do this, you do it like that, whereas the leadership is, OK, what do we want to achieve? Where do we want the business to go? How are we going to achieve that? Um, and it's, it's a very subtle difference. But gradually, we have had to rebuild that senior team. So um, we had a commercial director of 21 years who um, is now our new business development manager and absolutely thriving in that role um, since we brought a new head of sales into the business in in January we had a, um, a finance director bookkeeper um, 26 years he retired in March again I spent a bit of time last year 
um, recruiting somebody that had been um, vastly experienced FD in a, a big manufacturing organization and was now, I guess, a part time FD is the phrase that most people will be familiar with. Um, brought him in and again we've just brought a, uh, a new head of technical and quality into the business and again they've all brought um, sort of higher level board experience to the business and it's that it's the strategic thinking it's the accountability um, and, and whether I want to admit it or not I probably should have done that earlier but it took me that sort of initial six to twelve months to realize that actually we've got people here who used to told being told what to do whereas i need a group of people around me now that are actually going to take initiative take things by the scruff of the neck and actually you know if they say they're going to do that they do it and don't wait to be told to do it and that's quite common sam and i know you, you've talked to lots of other business owners mm -hmm. it's quite common that the, the next generation come in and, and it takes time actually to understand mm -hmm. who's there and what they're doing and the whole analogy the jim collins right people right seats on the bus it, it's been talked about a lot yeah. um but i guess also it's it's a different kind of strategic thought process that you as the next generation are putting your stamp on your business yeah. and actually the business that was there 35 years ago it's a very different business today so you do need as you said you've you've really developed the website you're doing all sorts of different things it needs different people with different skills absolutely yeah it's um again perhaps a bit corny suggest to suggest this but you know steve jobs used to say about um uh, apple you know we only bring people into the business that are going to tell us more than what we already know um and it's the same you know i was just we were just talking before this you know we brought up a new head of technical and quality into the business and literally on day one last week it was right i want to be doing this i want to be doing that and it's traditionally our in induction has very much been okay we'd like you to do this whereas now it's we're bringing people in with skills that we've not necessarily got um already in the business um because we you know we've got a plan to go from a to b and 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 without the new skills we're not going to get there um, to put it bluntly yeah but you're also creating a culture without putting words into your mouth you're you're creating that um that leadership culture so you're empowering them to to do what you bring, bring them in to do whereas it, it takes time doesn't it to transition from people being told what to do to coming in and being able to do what they know they want to do and they should do so there's a it's a fine line but it does evolve over time it is and it's you know as i said for me that it's it's about going from a management culture to a leadership culture and look i'm i'm not saying that we're 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 there paul it's it's you know we're still very much work in progress you know yeah. the management culture is the day-to-day -day stuff it's the you know the um doing things right i heard it once described as whereas leadership is very much doing the right things and you think well you've just said the same words just differently yeah it, that's all it is it's just a little tweak um and and one of the, the analogies that um uh, our new recruit um, used during uh, his interview process. And it was one of the many things that we liked about him was um, don't try and change things 10%, but try and change 10 things 1%. You know, and again, it's just those subtle differences in, in thinking that will get us to where we want to be. And that, that for me is really interesting. The other thing I'd like to go back to in terms of what you mentioned earlier was that, 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 that your Tim um, yes. really got your values and understood the values that underpin you as a family and then hence you as a family business what yeah. values are important to you what are your values do you know what this was something that i started working on when i very came into the very first came into the business because it had been important to me wherever i'd worked um previously okay i had one one blip year but again when i look back you know i understand why it was a blip um and i actually wrote the word core down you know as as, 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 a, as an exercise and you start thinking okay well you know, you know, C, committed, um, O, open and honest, R, respect, recognition, reward, um, E, efficient, and that eventually became efficient and professional. And, and that, and when I thought about it, well, I thought, well, actually, yeah, they are, they are the values that I hold as, as a person. They're the values that we hold as a business, because that's what we expect of people. We expect committed people. We don't want people to just churn up because it's a job. We want people to take pride in what they do. And that, you know, if it means that, you know, they, they, they stay until five past five rather than going at five, then that's the difference in, in the sort of people that we're bringing into the business now versus the perhaps we've had traditionally. Yeah, so it's it, again, it's an evolution, isn't it? A continuous evolution and continuous Absolutely. change, but it's, it's just subtle things you're doing all the time to take JFlex, I guess, to the next level. Yeah, and, and, and the thing is, we've, um, we were talking about books a little bit earlier um, before the recording. Um, what, one of the, 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 the greatest tools, and again, this is Tim that, that introduced this to me, was a book called Traction by Gino Wickman. And 
Um, plenty of people have, have seen the front cover and have probably got the book on their uh, bookshelf. Um, but there's quite a lot of tools in there that we've tried to, to implement in the business, one of them being the people analyzer. And again, you put your values at the top and you score people in a it's, a, it's in a way that it's not subjective because a lot of the appraisal style um, scoring systems are one to 10 or one to five. Whereas, you know, your idea of two might be my idea of three or one, you know, so we, we use the system out of, of traction um, whereby it's plus if people are meeting the criteria plus minus if they're sometimes meeting it and minus if they're not meeting it. And again, you remove that ambiguity then there's, there's no, no gray areas. It's black and white. It's, you know, you're either doing it or you're not basically. Yep. Which makes um, it, it's easy to understand then, isn't it, and communicate, so people know. Yeah, and so we, we, we built that into the, the appraisal process, and we also build the values into the uh, recruitment uh, process as well now. And again, when I look back at, you know, we, we brought a new head of sales in in January, head of finance in March, head of quality in, um, in uh, yeah, November, yeah, this month. <laughs> um, you know, again, I look at those people, and they are the sort of people that work the same way I do. Um and and they match those values 100 first and foremost which which is fantastic and i can see it coming through in terms of even just the way you talk and the way you talk about your values and the people it's it's kind of what you're becoming as, as an organization it's part of who you are yeah. um it's been a tough year and, and i don't really want to labor the the pandemic point but it would be remiss not to to touch on on the implications of 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 the pandemic i mean how have you had to respond and what have, I guess, what have you done in order to remain open your manufacturing, I guess, so you're a, um, an essential industry in terms of operation, yeah. but how have you made it safe for your employees and they still want to come to work and, and actually feel safe at work? I, I guess um, a couple of things, I mean, if we come on to sort of how we've sort of um, put measures in place, but I guess to start off with, again, to, to highlight the people we brought into the business and the difference in thinking, it was um traditionally if we got a challenge it was we'd have a, a, a chat as a senior team and then uh, inevitably john or latterly myself would end up making the decision whereas when we were faced with the pandemic we sat down as a team and, and our new head of finance literally came to that meeting with a cash flow forecast uh, based on worst case scenario best case scenario and somewhere in between where we thought we were going to be based on our sort of um projections given the feedback we'd had from certain customers um, we're, we're fortunate in that we work with a number of other essential industries, as you, as you mentioned, we're, we're technically classed as essential uh, industry, but some of the industries have, have fallen um, foul of the, the pandemic, so we knew there was going to be a, a lull, um, so we accounted for that, and again, it was a case of, what, you know, how many should we furlough, it was actually, if we're going to get through this, based on this projection, we need to furlough nine, and we furlough nine today, you know, it wasn't a discussion, it was, we need to do this. Yeah. So again, that sort of highlights for me the importance of having the right people in, in post. It, and again, in terms of, of, of making the business safe, we, we took the decision to go remote pretty, pretty early in the process. Um, and again, when you talk to a lot of businesses, probably, you know, 12, 18 months ago, if you were to tell them that now you'll all be remote, I think they would go, oh, well, we probably can't do that because we need to print and we need to do this and we need to have paper. And, um, and actually, we've, we've proven that when, when, you, when your arm is forced a little bit, when your hand is forced, that actually you can go remote um, and in some instances actually a bit more productive we've seen certainly um, the, the majority of our sales team are now based at home they've not been back since March um, and and yeah quite a few of them are saying well, actually we're, we're getting more done because there's no distractions at home we're not getting sort of you know what did you watch on TV last night what are you having for tea tonight um, those sorts of questions. Obviously, you know, we, we've put screens up, we've got sanitizing stations in place. We we put little kits together for everybody um, when we were sort of gradually bringing a few people back to the office uh, and the warehouse. Um, and again, we've, we've just kept talking to everybody because it's, yes, it's a business challenge, but it's also a, a mental health challenge as well. Obviously, this is new for a lot of people. You know, the, 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 the whole situation have been in, in, in lockdown, in isolation. We've got a number of colleagues who live by themselves. So it's been really important to, to make sure that we're, we're keeping in touch with them on a regular basis. We've just implemented Teams over the last month, which has been a great tool to be able to instant video call people and, and check in with them and make sure they're okay. Equally, those that were on furlough as well, we were making sure we were checking in with them on a regular basis because we wanted them to feel part of the team. And this is what we were doing to make sure they were back at work as soon as possible. Yeah, and that's that's a challenge for any managing director, I guess, this year, because you've had a team at work, potentially some people at home working from home and then others that are at home on furlough. Mm -hmm. And you're trying to manage that dynamic going forward 
or that what's going to happen when they come back going forward and work together just to make sure people don't feel that they weren't part of something is it has been a really big challenge it really has and i think that's the key word paul it's it's a challenge um and as as, as leaders of organizations you you don't ever have problems i don't think i think they're just challenges you've got to overcome and that's you know you try and look at it positively rather than looking at it as a negative um you, you know and i think as a business you know we've overcome a number of challenges over the years we've you know we've come through financial crisis you know, we, we lost a big customer in recent years, you know, 2 million out of 7 million turnover, you know, we've, we've, we've managed to come back from it. And, and like many other businesses um, that have, that have, you know, gone before, we'll, we'll, we'll come back from this. We're in a strong position to come out of it. I believe, um, look, we're not there yet. We're, we're getting back to some sort of normality. Um, but it's, it's obviously the winter months are going to be uh, interesting to see what happens in, in certain sectors, certainly. Yeah. So, so what do you see as the biggest challenges, um, Sam, going forward? <clears throat> I think for our business at the moment, um, probably Brexit is one of the biggest challenges. We export to 50 countries around the world. Um, we export to the majority of Europe. And we're already seeing one or two of the customers we have in, in particular in Germany, um, ask about you know tariffs and things. And obviously, it's the million dollar question at the moment, because we just don't know what it's actually going to look like, you know, it's, it's, I'm optimistic. I think we maybe get a deal. I probably shouldn't talk about politics and we'll, we'll, we'll move away from that area. <laughs> but um, I, I genuinely hope we get a deal because I think it's, I don't think it's anybody's interest to have, you know, tariffs. Can you imagine sort of German car makers having to whack 7% on the price? I don't think they're going to want to do that. So that's just my thought anyway. <laughs> But it's, but it's it, I think the biggest thing that you mentioned is, is is the uncertainty and the not knowing and it's the biggest thing for any of us isn't it not quite knowing what is going to happen in terms of the change of regulations not what's going to happen in terms of the global pandemic there's so many uncertainties out there that you're as an MD you're having to juggle and actually plan for 2021 and 2020 and beyond and actually it's quite hard it, it is but again it's it's one of the best phrases I've heard this year um sort of talking about COVID and, and talking about Brexit is is control the controllables at the end of the day, they are two events that you and I can't control, Paul, because unless you're involved in, you know, vaccine manufacturing or trade deals, then we, we just cannot, you know, yeah, we can, you know, be part of organisations and, and, and that lobby the government on things. But at the end of the day, we, we really can't influence them that much. So I know it probably sounds very relaxed, but, I, you know, try not to lose too much sleep about it because I can't influence those. Things. What I can influence is actually making sure that our products are available, that we're removing any any obstacles that might be obstacles to our customers. Again, yeah. with, with, the, with the pandemic, you know, talking to our colleagues, you know, are you happy coming back to the office? Because if they're not, then we need to make sure that we've got provision for them to be safe and work where if they can work from home, obviously, some of our roles, we can't exactly have sort of, you know, rolls of rubber lumped around at home, but, um, you know a lot of the roles we can do from home and it's it's you know they're the things that we can control yeah i've heard it quite a lot this year actually it's that british mentality i think as well comes to the fore that keep calm carry on and as you say then control the controllables and be in charge of the things you control and there are some things that may be kind of coming in from the right side or the left side and, and, and blinding you for a while but but your positivity shines through and you are probably one of the most positive and optimistic people i think i've talked <laughs> to um and for a long time um, but life's too short though that's you know there's no point getting negative about it i don't think i do i do agree with you completely agree with you um but every now and then it's I just i just think something comes you think oh my god no not not that on top of everything else but actually i think the resilience of family firms across the world but in particular this year from our perspective the ones that we talked to in britain the resili resi resilience is a quality i think family firms have really demonstrated and and you clearly have a resilient team behind you and working with you yeah, and I, look, I think it, the, the key thing is, is um, everybody's bought into what we want to do as a business. You know, we are changing the profile of the business a little bit. Um, you know, this year we, we have made some um, difficult decisions in terms of our internal policies. Um, and, and some of them were risky and I accept they were, they were risky, um, but actually they have paid off. Um, I, I could smugly sit here and say they were calculated risks. <laughs> One or two of them, I'm not sure, but we, we, you know, we we believe that was the right thing to do at the time, and actually, it has proven to be the case now. And and for me, that that buy-in has been really important because we've we've shared as as a senior team this year, we've we've shared our strategic plan with the company in a way that we've never shared before. So we've shared an awful lot of information. We've said, look, you know, we anticipate in the first few months of COVID that this will be the impact to the business. Please don't panic because we've, we've budgeted for that accordingly. You know, yeah. we, we understand the implications of this. And I think 
that is one of the big differences this year is that we have shared an awful lot of information that people probably haven't seen before. Um, and we've, we've tried to share it in a way that it's not just, you know, management speak and gobbledygook that, you know, people go, oh, yes, profit and what have you and, and margin. And we've, we've tried to explain it in a way that people understand because, yeah. again, you know, you, you can be part of these peer groups, you know, left, right and centre. And it's pretty obvious that, you know, some people sometimes aren't sure what some of these terms mean. And, you know, as in, you know, colleagues in their businesses. So, we've, you know, we've tried to make it understandable for, for everybody because, you know, we don't want that ambiguity. We don't want grey areas and people going, oh, well, that, that's not very good. You know, when actually, look, we are in control of things. We know the impact of this. Trust us. Yeah. So if you looked back to when you started all those years ago, or not all those years ago, a, a few years <laughs> ago. Sorry. I know I've got a few um, grey hairs, but... <laughs> I'm not going on the hair conversation. Um, if you look back to your younger self when you started at, at JFlex, you took on the role at the bottom of the ladder. What advice or what, what do you wish you'd done differently and what advice would you give to your younger self? And if you were a next gen coming in now, what advice would you give to you as that next gen stepping in to make it more um, successful, achievable, to make a difference from the start? I think and it's, it's something I still remind myself every time we sit down for a meeting is it's one word is listen. I think, you know, again, it's a very British thing. We like, if we're asked a question, we, we like to jump in with something straight away. Or the, a lot of people like to jump in. And I've always been somebody that will jump in straight away because I've not been a fan of silence. And maybe that's the, you know, the media days, you know, silence was never a good thing in, in, in the world of media. But, but actually, um, I do, I write it on my, my notes every time we have a, a senior team meet and I write, listen, because for me as a, as a, as a leader of business now, it should not be um me doing most of the talking in that meeting it should be the guys that report into me that are doing the talking it's me asking questions so i think that's you know one of the the biggest bits of advice that i would give my younger self and anybody in in that position is actually listen you know consider what's being said you don't always have to be the first person in the room to talk um and that for me was very difficult to get and Probably not. Some, some would argue i'm sure some would argue i still not mastered it um, it's very much, as, as, as with most things, very much a work in progress, but at least I'm writing it down now and looking at it every time we, we have a meeting. Um, and I, do, I even say that to the guys that when, when they have their meetings, and I used it earlier this week with, with, with the head of sales, you know, he was, he'd had a call with a, um, a, a colleague and he was really excited about a little project we've got underway. Um, and I asked him the question, I said, who did the most talking in the meeting? And he stopped and he went, huh. Yeah, I suppose I did most of the talking, actually. And again, it's, it's, as I say, this is a learning curve for all of us. We're all very much going on this journey together and, and supporting and, 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 and encouraging each other. I, I think the one thing I take from you as well, and you mentioned the word learning again then, before, beforehand we were talking about books and stuff. So you're constantly learning. Like you're always sourcing new ideas, whether it's the peer group. You're kind of, your propensity to learn is part of what I think what drives you. Yeah, because at the end of the day, I, I believe... For me, it's that key difference between management and leadership. You know, we, we, we had, and I don't mean this in a horrible way, because I, I, I sincerely, um, the, the people that were involved in those changes, I, I wish them nothing but the best for the future, but it was the right thing to do for the business. But we had a number of bad leaders in our organisation, and I think you can easily spot those bad leaders because the people that have got high IQ, but low EQ, low emotional intelligence, and I think it's it's they become almost like dictators and you know it's it's well I know that and that's all I need to know whereas for me leadership is very much about actually opening up your mind to, to new ideas new ways of working um you know empowering people but also acknowledging what your strengths and weaknesses are and working on those those areas for improvement and look I, I we've got a, a vastly experienced head of financing I am never going to know or be an expert in finance. That's why I hire somebody to be head of finance. And it's not for me to tell him how to do his job. It's actually, these are my recommendations as a head of finance. You know, are you in agreement? You know, so it's, I will always sort of go and look for wisdom and education in it. You know, if I feel it's gonna benefit me and the business um, and, and allow me to understand something better um, and, and Somebody, and I forget who it was now, somebody once told me, um, the day you think you know it all is the day to retire. And I think that's that's partly what's driven me as well is, you know, don't ever stop learning about things. And, you know, we're exploring some new technology at the moment. I know nothing about it. 
and there's very few of us in the business that know anything about it but we've gone and talked to advisors about it we've gone and actually physically talked to people that that make this technology you know to yeah. try and learn everything and anything we can that we think will help us get where we want to be as a business so um yeah i'll i'll you know keep reading but i'm not a, do you know what I'm, I'm not a massive reader i I've, i really struggle to pick up books and things but certainly traction uh, gino wickman and um uh, the chimp paradox steve peters two of the best books i've ever read probably two of the only books i've ever fully read from cover to cover <laughs> to be perfectly honest but they've uh, obviously done something to keep my attention because I, like I say i do struggle with, with with books in particular but you know whether it's part of peer learning groups or online learning or physically going and looking at something um yeah. absolutely yeah I'll, I'll go and do it because you know i, I like to I suppose I've got a curious mind. You know, you like to know these things. <laughs> well, I'm, yeah, a lot of family business owners are very similar to you, to be fair. They just, they, they're constantly striving for something new to bring back and use and apply. And I think that's kind of the innovative part and the entrepreneurial part of, of family firms. Um, one last question, really, just, just, just before we wrap up in terms of where do you see the business in, say, 10, 15 years time? What's your vision? <laughs> the vision for the future of the business is to, um, to grow it to about 10 million. Um, and... I've always said 10 million and then sell it. But to be honest, if it carries on being this much fun, I don't know whether I want to, to sell it, to be perfectly honest. Um, You'll be very young in 10 years time as well, Sam. So Something like that. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think I'd retire. And there, there's me chip off the old block. There you go. You see, I never thought I'd be that person, but um, I think it's, you know, go back to the point I made earlier, you're at work a long time, you know, you've got to do something that you enjoy. It's got to be fun. And yeah, look, as you said, you know, we come up against challenges every single day of the week and we, we employ 20 people. So with that, you've got 20 people's challenges, um, you know, and, and all they care about is is their own little world, you know, and, and the challenges that they've got in their world. So they're completely unaware that you've got all these other challenges. But, um, you know, I, I, you don't look at it negatively. You just accept that, that it's for me, that's part of the role. Um, but I, yeah, I think certainly 10 years time, um, yeah, we'd like to be at, at least at 10 million. We've got a clear plan in place that we believe will achieve that. Again, it's got to mean something. You know, we don't just want to give give product away. Um, it, it's got to mean something. And we've, we've done a lot of good work this year in, in sort of shifting the profile of our customers to, to sort of larger, not necessarily blue chip organizations, but certainly original equipment manufacturers um, and, and bigger in profile than traditionally we have dealt with. And again, they're sort of, you know, a bit more willing to give you multi-year deals. And again, once we, we, we build our pipeline based on, on those sort of things, I think it makes that goal far more achievable. And look, we, if we get there, if, when we get there, there's the positive. Um, it may be, look, let's try 15, let's try 20. You know, it, it, it depends how much fun I'm having. <laughs> yeah. Well, we wish you all the best. Uh, you're, you're honest in your, the, the, the story you shared this morning has been fantastic. And I know it will resonate with an awful lot of our audience out there. Thank you. Um, days like today wouldn't be possible. I have to just a bit of a plug in here without the, the support of our partners. So Vistage, Mattioli Woods um, and Western Pension Solutions, who do an awful lot for the family business community and, and the work that we do to support the community. Um, wouldn't be, We couldn't do what we did without them. So thank, thank, thanks them for their generosity and their support. Sam, thank you so much for your time this morning. Um, we look forward to hearing the next stages in your chapter as it evolves into um, a bigger and even better business going forward. And I um, wish you all the luck for success. Bless you. Thanks ever so much. And uh, stay safe. Yeah, thanks for your time today. Cheers, Sam.